High Jumping Physics, The Secrets for Doing It Right. It happened at the high school state track meet. There were two jumpers from the same team, ranked one and two in the state. Each jockeyed back and forth from the long jump pit to the high jump pit since they both competed in multiple events. I watched them closely, and when they returned to the high jump pit together, they performed some bounding and jumping exercises to loosen up. Something was wrong though. The number two jumper was getting a lot more air during the bounding exercises than the number one jumper. Upon closer inspection, the number one jumper was laboring and trying his best but couldn't come close to the leaping ability of the number two jumper. To be honest, the number two jumper looked much more athletic. When warm-up jump started, the number two jumper leapt immensely over the low warm-up height. The number one jumper missed his first two practice attempts. The number one jumper tried another attempt and almost fell down, rounding the curve, and returned to his starting position. A novice observer would be puzzled watching the display. How could it be? Confusing, isn't it? Then, the number one jumper took four or five steps before he leaned heavily into his curve and away from the bar, planted his takeoff foot, and that's when you see why he's a number one jumper in the state. He planted his takeoff foot well ahead of his hips while still leaning, leaning not just away from the bar but backwards as well. His plant foot, plant leg, hip, left abdomen, and left shoulder were in a straight line angled back and away from the bar. The whole solid line resembled a 50 degree lean. He blocked his left side and drove his arms and knee, forcing his approach speed to explode upward. He cleared the practice bar at least a foot higher than the number two jumper. The number two jumper was a leaper and leapers can jump high like basketball players. They can get their hands to a high level based upon the strength and extension of their thigh muscles but they can't get their whole body to a high level, only their hands and arms. High jumpers, on the other hand, transfer their speed another way and it allows the whole body to follow in an amazing way. This is a high jumper transferring speed upwards. Here's another high jumper transferring speed upwards. I'll talk more about the differences later on in the video. Let's start with the approach. The approach is 95% of the jump. Get this part correct and you're nearly home free. At the start, concentration and envisioning are needed as a jumper sees him or herself completing the entire jump in their mind. Envision your approach, takeoff, bar clearance, and landing in your imagination before you start your approach. After envisioning the jump, a routine and personalized movement is needed. Nothing is set in stone for this and many different styles are correct. Whatever movement gets you going is best. Lean, hop, jog, pretend you're catching bouncing sun rays if you like, but keep it consistent and the same each time. Use a mark with tape or chalk to officially hit your straightaway. Once you're in motion, have a checkpoint to start the straight part of your approach and know which foot should hit it. Your approach should be four or five steps and consistent with speed and stride length. The jumper should run tall with great rotation of his or her heels and knees. This is called great wheels. This means bringing your heels to your butt and high knee drive with every step. Your shin should be parallel to the ground with every stride. Some bounding strides can be included and the jumper should begin accelerating to a quick speed that can be handled. By handled, I mean smooth and rhythmic strides. Now as speed is increasing slightly, it's time to hit your next mark and begin the curved part of your approach. This is where the fun begins. The curve should be run in a straight and tall position with a lean towards the center of the curve and away from the bar. The lean can be run on the toes or flat-footed with crossover steps in order to stay on the curve. The lean should be from the ankles with no bend at the hips, torso, or shoulders. 
The approach momentum will carry around the curve and slightly increase if run correctly. Remember, it must be rhythmic and smooth as the jumper nears the penultimate and ultimate steps. Time for the penultimate step. The penultimate step is the second to last step. There's a lot of controversy about this step in many opinions. I'm only going to say to use the penultimate step to start to move into the angles you need for the last step. In other words, begin to move your shoulders back and your hips forward on this step. It will be natural to drop your hips a little bit, but only just slightly. Your height will not be determined by your hip drop. In fact, if you drop your hips too much, you will become a leaper and you won't be able to get the block angle correct. You will then lose height. This will also be the only step not on the curve. Let it land outside the curve and closer to the bar. But don't worry, you will come back to the curve with the ultimate step. Before I talk about the last step and takeoff, here is a suggested approach path. Please note the start is a few feet away from the start of the straightaway. Please also note that the penultimate step is slightly outside the curve. One last thing I will talk about in the takeoff, the last step is not parallel to the bar. It should be pointed at the back of the pit. You should arrive at the last step with a dorsiflex foot position. You will land your foot heel to toe with toes pointed high. This allows for a fast transfer of energy because the energy will roll from heel to toe. It's smooth and the foot will not be on the ground very long. If you land flat footed, you will stomp the ground and the stomp will lose energy which will cause you to lose height. Try to plant with a straight legged block with barely a bend in the knee. Do not lock the knee ever. You will hyperextend your knee and get injured. The plant also happens well ahead of the body with with the shoulders leaning back, especially the shoulder furthest away from the bar. As noted in the diagrams, the whole side of the body furthest from the bar should be in a relative straight line with the jumper leaning back and away from the bar. This is the angle and the line needed to transfer the speed. This is the block and there will be a lot of pressure. Leapers cannot move this speed upwards effectively. Leapers may be able to get their hands high and dunk basketballs hard, but let's face it, the rest of the body lags behind and drags underneath them. A foot plant underneath the hips and the jumper in an upright position without any backward lean won't transfer the energy upward enough. The energy will simply fly forward. Sometimes the jumpers even think they took off too close to the bar but the truth is that your momentum simply went forward. Another opportunity example would be the jumper not leaning into the curve at foot plant. They may have leaned a lot running around the curve, but for some reason straightened up on the ultimate step. Even if they have correct blocking angles and they're leaning back, and they have a straight left leg, and that solid line is there, if they are not leaning into the curve, and away from the bar at the ultimate step, uh, they won't fully rotate over the bar. They will drag their lower body and knock the bar off. You must maintain the curve lean through the ultimate step. Remember when the penultimate step lands outside the curve slightly? The jumper will then plant the ultimate step back on the curve, causing some torque against the momentum moving forward. This will add a touch more pressure to help the momentum move upward. Finally, the blocking angles and leans needed to move the running momentum upwards will create a lot of pressure on the foot and ankle. Remember, it's a dorsiflex foot plant, which means it's moving smoothly, heel to toe. The jumper must handle the block pressure in this moment for the momentum to go up. Now it's time to take off. After landing the ultimate step and blocking correctly, <clears throat> it's time to drive the knee closest to the bar along with the arms. The knee drive should be away from the bar as noted in the diagrams. See how the pressure of the momentum is bending the torso. The knee drive accompanied with the arm drive allows the momentum to move up. 
but only if the actions happen while still leaning into the curve. If you don't have the lean, all the blocking and driving will still throw the momentum into the bar, or you could become a leaper and try to hop over the bar. Once in flight, the mechanics of the lean and the curve will take over. The lean and blocking causes the hips to rotate naturally over the bar, while the curve of the approach causes the body to spin and place the back of the jumper over the bar without trying, even when the ultimate foot plan is facing towards the back corner of the pit. There will always be a little tilt over the bar, but it's natural and nothing to worry about. It means your speed and curve angles are correct. If you're flat over the bar or perpendicular, then something went awry. When landing, the natural rotation continues as the body hits the pit. That means the jumper should land on his or her neck and the momentum from your legs and feet pulling you over so you end up face down near the back corner of the pit. You should not land on your back if the jump was executed correctly. You should also not land near the bar, a common leaper mistake. Notice this jumper landing on her neck and her legs continuing to rotate, a good jump. That concludes my high jumping physics video and may you be able to win a medal like this one day.